Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. This is Isaiah 51b. That's Yeshayahu, Perak Nun Aleph. And today we will be studying only three verses, 9, 10, and 11. Um, and uh, as uh, 51a, we studied through verse 8. I am going to... I would like to point out that the only really... The best way to fully understand these three verses um, would be to review quickly the context within which they are being stated. So I'm going to have to go back and do a little bit of a review, pointing out certain things that can help us understand what Yeshayahu is trying to bring out here. Um, so first of all, let me go back to chapter 50, Nun, the last parak. In that ch- chapter, both Yeshayahu and God addressed the Jewish people and asked them, begged them, really, to listen, to listen to the message of God, to listen to the message of God, which is the message of this entire book, to keep the Torah of God, which means to keep his teachings, justice, righteousness, and bring that message to the world. And they both beseeched the Jewish people and in the following way. Yeshayahu if we go back for a moment, um, I just want to remind you some of the key verses in Yeshayahu, the prophet himself, when he begged the people to listen, he said, um, I'm sorry, uh, first let's start with God himself in fifty, uh, in chapter Nun, verse 2. Madua bossi v'enish, right? Why is it that when I come to speak to you, there's no one there listening, Right? Is my arm too short? Am I unable, my arm too weak to redeem you, to save you? Do I not have the strength? With my roar, with my voice, I was able to dry the sea. And so on. So God was, there was kind of a reference there, clearly the image of I can save you. You know I can save you. I mean, I, ridiculous. I'm God, right? I saved you from Egypt. I dried the sea for you. I performed those things. Can, do you think, am I not capable? Is that why you're not listening? And then, Yeshayahu went ahead and said um, uh, 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 to the people, um, as in the second part of chapter 50, he again went ahead and started telling the people to listen. And what he said, I want to um, read from verse uh, um, uh, 6, Yeshayahu emphasizes his own willingness to go out on a limb and suffer and not pay attention to the detractors, not pay attention to the people that would make fun and point fun at him, right? Where Yeshayahu said, Gevi nosati limakim, I gave over my body to those that were striking me, l'chayai l'martim, panai lo histarti miklimot I didn't hide myself because I was ashamed or afraid or scared, right? But rather, I asked you to, you know, I was stepped up to the plate and acted on, um, despite the fact that it was against the grain, it was against what other people uh, wanted. And then he ended, Yeshayahu ended by saying in verse 10 and 11, Mi bocham Adonai, who among you fears God, shomea b'kol avdo, that's willing to listen to the message, his servant, me, Yeshayahu's message, uh, uh, right, Yiftach b'shem Hashem, you should have faith in God, and and then he says, however, hein kuchem, but most of you, kod cheish ma'azrei zikos, most of you are just bringing about destruction, fire, and so on, because most of you are ignoring the message. Now, um, uh, then in the so remember that. So again, God begs the people to listen because he says, I have the strength. I saved you back in Egypt. Yeshayahu says, I stepped forward despite the fact that I had to suffer for it and I was not ashamed. I stepped forward. And then God comes back and says in the beginning of chapter 51, which we just read in the last podcast, and this is really important to pay attention. Shimuei Lai wrote Vetzedek. God says, listen to me, those of you that... I'm, wait, I'm sorry. The, the beginning of 51, it's, again, it's Yeshayahu continuing his talk to the people. And he's saying, listen to me. Not God speaking yet, but Isaiah, Yeshayahu speaking. Um, 
Listen to me, those of you that are ser- searching out, that are run, that 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 do desire, that do pursue righteousness, right? Hashem, those that habitu al Look back, look back at the um the rock from which you were hewn, which is habitu al Avram avichem. Look back to Abraham, your forefather, and Sarah to Chol Elchem, and Sarah and Sarah, your your matriarch, who was your for mother, right? And she um she birthed you in pain and she birthed you in suffering. But those people, right? Ki echod ki I, this is the prophet speaking in God's name, called them one. And if you recall in the last podcast, I went through several different explanations as to why Ishayahu looked back and said, told these people to encourage them to choose to listen to the message rather than ignore it. He told them to look back at the forefathers. The point is, Yishayahu is saying, Echad Krasiv, they were called singular, alone. They were alone in their time. They stepped forward and heeded God's message in a time when it wasn't popular. Again, Yishayahu emphasizing that point. Look back at them and do it. And then God goes ahead and says, Hakshivu Eli Ami. My nation, listen to me, God says, right, in 51. And he says, Karov tzidki, yatsoyishi, listen to me. And God says, right, what are his words? And this is really, really, really important. Um, um, uh, Shimu elayo de tzedek amtur asibalibam, that my Torah is in your heart. Al tiru cherpat enosh. Do not be afraid of embarrassment from him. And when they make fun of you, when they poke fun of you, don't be afraid. Again now, so Yeshayahu emphasized this point. Yeshayahu said, look back at Abraham and Sarah because they were echad, they were alone. And they went against the grain of the public. And God himself then goes and tells the Jewish people and encourages them to do the same and not be afraid of being different. Don't be afraid of carrying a message and worry about what everyone else says, what everyone else does. And then we start with today. Now that we have all of this um, in our background, we can understand these next three verses. And these next three verses are fascinating. Here, now, Ishayahu, and it's really important to keep track of who's talking to who and who's talking about who. So we just finished God speaking to the Jewish people, and now Yeshayahu, the prophet, turns to God and says a prayer. These next three verses are the prayer of Yeshayahu. And hear how the prayer goes. And I want to point out, before I even read this, that this entire prayer is written in the feminine language. It's extremely unfortunate that when you translate Hebrew into English, other than occasionally the word he or she, you lose the entire sense of the feminine versus masculine words. And in Hebrew, this entire um, a prayer, Yeshayahu prays specifically to God as a woman. God calls, Isaiah calls God she and her. And every word, when he says, Uri, Uri, that's how he starts. Wake up, wake up, God, wake up. You know, rescue us, wake up. He says, Uri, which would be directed towards a woman. Uri, if he was talking to a man, it would be Ur or Or, right? But he says, Uri, Uri, live she, God, as a woman, dress, oh, dress in strength. He specifically calls God a woman, even when he's referring to God's strength, which often is, is considered a masculine feature. But here he tells God, live she, oh, God, as a woman, dress in things. Zero, ah, I don't like. You're with your strength. And he uses God's name in a feminine sentence. So he's addressing God as a woman. Then he says, Uri kime kedem. Again, as a feminine, but Uri, wake up, kime kedem, like you did in the old days. Right? Remember, God said that the old days, I dried the sea for them. So tell them, I could do it now. So Yeshayahu now comes and says to God, Do it. Do it. Wake up like you did, Dorot Olamim, in those past generations and those long, that were long ago. Hello, at he. And again, he addresses God. You are she, you are she who, hamachatsevet, right? Consistent in, in, a, in a feminine language, hamachatsevet rahav, that you have hewn out the rahav, hewn out. Now, I'm going to read this, this chapter, hamachatsevet rahav, micholelet tanin. 
before I, I translate it the way I would like to translate it, I'm going to translate it first the way most of the commentaries do. And they assume that Rahab is a reference to Egypt, and I'll explain why they say that. And hewn out means you chopped out. You, in other words, you punished Egypt. Micholela tanin, and you micholela from a language of of either chilol to profane something, or chalolim, um, which is first the corpses to kill. Micholela tanin, you have killed the serpent, and tanin being a reference to Pharaoh of Egypt, as we see in Ezekiel and Yechezkel, there's also a verse where God refers to Paro as Hatanin Hagadol, the great serpent. That's in Ezekiel 29. Now, um, I don't like this explanation, even though most of the, the commentaries do translate it that way, and almost every translation I saw translates it this way. And before I, I tell you the way I'm going to translate it, I would like to explain what I don't like about it. Because these same terms, Hamachatsevet Rahab, right? We just said several verses ago, Habitu el Tzor Chutzavtem. Look at the rock from which you were hewn, right? It used that same language, Chutzavtem, Machatsevet, that same exact Hebrew word. It used it to refer to create something, to build something, not to destroy something. And in general, that term, chutzav tehem, lachatzov, does not mean, it means to cut, but it means to cut constructively, to cut out a rock from, 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 like to, from a quarry, when you cut out a rock to use as a brick, to use as a, as a, as a tool to make into something. So chutzav, uh, uh, a machtsev is someone who, who, who creates rock, uh, 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 utensils and, and or things like that. So, so I don't think it means, like they said, Hamachat Sevet Rav, he destroyed Rav to Egypt. In addition, I don't like this, because the reference that they use to claim that Rahab refers to Egypt is they, they point to a verse back in um, um, thirty in, in, in chapter 30, Lamed. Uh, chapter 30 verse 7 where God was then criticizing the Jewish people for instead of relying on him the prophet was saying you should have relied on God and instead of, instead, instead, instead of relying on me God you went and you turned to Egypt and you went down to Egypt to look for an ally and Egypt's not going to help you they're, 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 gonna, they're not reliable and God says then if we go back to verse 7 he says, Egypt, they're going to help you like a bunch of nonsense. They're not going to help you. Right? They're going to be a waste of your time. Therefore, I call this, this that you, Israel, is going down to Egypt to ask for help. Rahav Haim Shavet. They are living in Rahav. Rahav then means arrogance or pride. They are living in arrogance or pride. So it's not... You could say that it's referring to Egypt here because Egypt, but it's kind of a very spurious uh, um, connection here. God is here criticizing the Jewish people for being arrogant and not being humble before him and looking for their own solutions by looking in the wrong places to Egypt. So Rav here really means arrogance, okay? And how do I know that Rav means arrogance? Because I'm going to give you a few other examples of where this term Rav was used. In Isaiah itself, chapter 3, verse 5, Isaiah was criticizing the people at the time of the, of the destruction of Jerusalem for being disrespectful to one another. And what did he say? He said, in chapter 3, he said, Yirhavu hanar bazokein. The young uh, youth will be arrogant over the elders. In other words, they will not have respect. Yirhavu, rahav, the same word, yirhavu. In addition, we see in Tehillim, chapter 40, we see where, where God says, Ashrei HaGever, in Psalms this is, Psalms 40, verse 5, Praise is the man, Asher Som Adonai Miftacho, that has faith in God, Velo Fana El Rehavim, but he does not turn to those who are arrogant. In other words, those people who ignore God, he doesn't turn to the arrogant ones, Visote Chazav, and those people that, that, that teach or follow falsehood, right? That's the false arrogance. Again and again in Psalms 89, 
um, at Tehillim, uh, Parak Pei Tes, 89, verse um, um, 11, it says, Atod dikiso kecholol rohav. You have crushed like a dead body. You have crushed rohav, those that are, that, that are arrogant, and, 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 and so on. So rahav means arrogant. So hamachatsevet rahav doesn't sound like it's referring to Egypt for the reasons which I just said. Furthermore, mecholelet tanin, he immediately says, the mecholelet tanin, he who and, uh, um, is mecholelet. We just used a few verses ago that same exact language. Just like we used machasevet yun from the rock, then afterwards we said, v'el sora techol elchem, and look back towards Sarah, the one who birthed you. So that same term was used in reference to birth, to building. It wasn't used to destroying or killing. So I don't like the translation, mecholelet tanin, to mean over here, you who destroyed the serpent. Because how could it mean destroyed? He's, he's re- obviously referring back to, to the flip side of the same language he used before. Hamachatzevet rahab mecholelet tanin, which is parallel to, um, um, to the verses, Tzor chutzav tem and sorot tuchol elchem, the same words. So therefore, I would like to translate it as follows. And especially if you keep in mind the context that I've been building here. And let me read this verse the way I believe it should be read. Uri, Uri, live she owes. Wake up, God, wake up, God. Get dressed in strength. Zero Adonai, get strength, get dressed with the power, the strength of the arm of God. Uri, ki mekedem. Wake up like you did in the days of old, Doros Olamim, in the old generations from years and years and years ago. Halo ati, behold, you are she. You, God, you are she. Hamachat sevet rahav. You are the one who have hewn out arrogance. You created the suffering which we're suffering. Mucholelatanin. You are the one who birthed the serpent from which we are suffering. Right? And therefore, you, God, could be the one who takes it away. Halo ati, he continues, behold, aren't you also again, you are she, hamacharevet yam, that can dry the sea, made to home rabba, the waters of the deep depths, hasoma ma'amake yam, the one who makes the depths of the sea, derech, into a path, la'avor ge'ulim, where the redeemed ones can, pat, can tread. So the point here is, is that even though you created the suffering, because remember, what did God just say? Right in the last chapter again, uh, I want you to keep bear in mind the context here. God said, "Madua basivinish." Why is it that I came and no one's listening? Am I, am I unable to redeem you? I could redeem you. I've uh, dec- haven't I dried the sea? But rather, what am I going to do? God says, "Al bishomayim kadrush v'sakosim kususam." I am going to make the skies dark. I'm going to make you suffer because you're not listening. So here Yeshayahu is praying to God and he's saying, God, you are the one that's making the suffering and you have the power to, to, to take it away. Right? That's what it means, Hamachatsevet Rahab. You're the one who created it. You're the one who made it. All right? You're the one who's doing the suffering. And therefore, he continues in verse 11 with the end of his prayer to God, Ufiduye Adonai Yishuvun. Now this pasuk, this verse here, 11, is almost exactly identical to another verse which has almost the same words with the exception of one letter, which I will talk about in a minute, in chapter 35, verse 10, where it also says over there, but in 35, verse 10, the context was a beautiful, wonderful chapter about how there's going to be an open path and the wild beasts won't attack and it's going to be a path to to Zion and people are going to come from around the world on this beautiful path with the trees and the flowers and the blossoms and everything. And it said at the end that the redeemed of God will return, on berina, and they will all come to Zion in song, v'simchato lama orsham, and a joyfulness that will last forever will be in their mind, in their heads, in their hearts. So son v'simcha yasigun, they will finally achieve happiness and and joy. V'nasu yagon va'anacha. This is what it said there in chapter thirty-five. And worry. And anguish will run, will be gone. Here, the the vav from vinasu is taken away. In this verse here, in eleven, it doesn't say vinasu and 
they will go away, but rather it says, Nosu Yogon Vanacha, which sends more of a, therefore, that changes the entire meaning of the Pasuk as follows. The whole Pasuk here reads, not as a prophecy about the future, which he was talking about in 35, but it's a prayer about what he's asking God to bring about. And he says, And God, please redeem the redeemed of God. Right? So that they can come to Zion in song. And so that they can have the happiness forever. And Nosu, may you banish. Nosu, chase away suffering and anguish. This concludes uh, 51b, looking forward to studying further into this wonderful chapter 51 with you with the next podcast. Mm-hmm.